Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Albert Huang. I am an uh, associate professor of medicine and I've been an investigator on the NCHAP team uh, since wave two. And I'm part of an mul overall multidisciplinary team which will be reflected by the other speakers with different backgrounds and scientific backgrounds. So the overall theoretical framework that under, underpins the NCHAP study is that health is determined not only by the, the health trajectories of individuals, but is shaped and produced by their social networks and families. And in particular, at older ages, the dominant form of the social network is a dyad, and typically it is a marriage. And I'll show you data later from our own study that shows the typical social network that older people have. And, and we, and, uh, based on a lot of prior research, uh, there's an there's, um, uh, underlying hypothesis that a strong social network and strong social ties are important determinants of good health at older ages. Those who are older and are socially isolated or un unpartnered unfortunately lack the benefit of those social networks and are therefore at higher risk of, of health problems. So the overall hypothesis is that social context matters in the health of older people. These are the, the numbers of individuals and the multiple waves of data that is available in NCHAP. So NCHAP started in 2001 and initially enrolled uh, 3,005 older adults uh, between the ages of 57 and 85. And from that original cohort, we have followed those individuals two additional times. Once in wave two in 2010 and 2011, we, those or original 3,005 individuals became 2,322 from wave, in wave two. And in wave three, we have reapproached those individuals again across a 10 year span uh, now, um, now all of them 10 years old. In wave two, we made the following additions to the NCHAP study. We approached the partners, the romantic partners of original wave one respondents, um, about 955 adults, and added them to the NCHAP study. And in wave three, which is now in the field, revisiting original wave one respondents, um, we have now added a new cohort that represents uh, 2,500 individuals from the baby boomer generation. Uh, the data collection for NCHAP comes from multiple forms. We conduct a 100, a two, basically a two hour in-home interview uh, we conduct a computer-assisted questionnaire um, and also collect biomeasure data in the home. We leave patient and subjects with a paper and pencil questionnaire, a leave-behind questionnaire, which they, with additional questions for them to fill out. And in wave two and wave three, we introduced a um, activ activity sub-study uh, that collects data uh, on their physical activity and motion for three to four days. That allows us to study sleep, activity during the day, and so on. These are the major domains of inquiry from NCHAP. Uh, but what's unique about NCHAP is, I believe, the, the, social, the, the enriched data regarding social networks, social support, and social activities. Uh, NCHAP also, from its origins in wave one, has always had also a special focus on sexuality, which is also unique. And, and then the rest of the other domains are um, uh, typical, important for um, basic measures of health, including physical health, mental health. Uh, we have inserted, um, we have a formal assessment of cognition during the during NCHAP in-person interview. We collect data on all the medications that patients take both prescription drugs, but also um, non-prescription drugs that the patients take. Uh, we use the brown bag technique. We uh, collect information about employment, finances, religion, personality, and attitudes. 
and if we dive down into the among the, the specific biomarkers of health uh, and key health domains in NSHAP, uh, these are the six major domains of data we collect. I won't go into each one, but we collect data on physical function and conditions. We uh, collect data on diseases and risk for diseases. We um, have unique um, data collection on uh, sensory functions, in particular uh, the sensory function of smell. But we also assess taste, touch, vision, and hearing. Uh, we collect endocrine data of, um, of hormones such as testosterone, progesterone, estradiol, and DHEA. We collect biomarker data on immune function, Epstein-Barr virus titers, and CRP, marker of inflammation. And then, of course, we collect data on health behaviors and uh, data on smoking, stress, and sociability. These, uh, the latter two are actually hormones. This slide um, should be helpful to potential users of NSHAP. It shows uh, the specific biomeasures that have been collected over the three waves of NSHAP. Some have been um, added over time, such as actigraphy, which was added in wave two. Um, some biomeasures have been dropped over time, such as the buccal swab, and um, and some some data elements such as such as DNA we have collected at wave two, not collecting during wave three, but we hope to uh, collect all data of that of all genetic data from all uh, participants at a later date. Um, some of these choices have been made because of uh, budgetary reasons, but DNA doesn't. You know, we can revisit DNA at a, a different time for some of these cohorts. Uh, the physical performance assessment has changed a bit over time. In wave one, we did a get up and go assessment, um, but this was uh, altered to, do, to become the short physical performance battery in wave two and wave three. This includes a chair stand, and you can see our uh, model subject doing a chair stand without using her arms or hands. And then we also do a timed walk. Across all three waves of data, we have um, invested in data in dried blood spot collection, which has allowed us to do assays of Epstein-Barr virus, CRP, hemoglobin A1C for diabetes and prediabetes, and hemoglobin. Um, and, uh, in wave three, we are doing the same. We are also collecting dry blood spots in the same manner, uh, and we'll be likely and we'll be doing many of the same assays. Uh, sensory function has undergone some changes. In wave one, we assess touch, taste, and vision, um, but have not done so in more more recent waves. We have collected data on smell across all three waves of NCHAP. Uh, in that picture, you see uh, the, the smell pens that we use to assess um, odor identification and, and overall uh, olfactory functioning. Um, in terms of diseases and morbidity, uh, we have uh, routine, we have sent, we typically relied on the patient's report of ever having a doctor said that they, that they had a condition, and this is the uh, these are the conditions that we have collected on. Um, heart attack, arthritis, ulcers, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, and so on. This allows us, and with, in combination with medication data and biomarker data, this allows us to even identify individuals who are not aware that they have a condition or are being treated for a condition and do not, are not aware that they have the condition. These are the uh, data on different procedures and surgeries uh, that, are part of the, that are part of the uh, CAPI survey. Um, some of these items have been dropped um, in subsequent waves of data, and, and in the third wave because of space and time constraints. Uh, this is the data collected on um, functional functional health. We've completed. Uh, we've collected. Um, functional health is very important, of course, in assessing people's health, and we've uh, maintained data collection across um, all these data elements, both uh, com comprehensive assessment of ADLs as well as instrumental activities of daily living. This is um, how the, access, the data can be accessed through NACTA and uh, within ICPSR. Uh, we, 
data users must submit a data use agreement. They must have a copy of an IRB approval from your institute, home institution, and you must have a data protection plan. Uh, but access to NSHAP should be fairly easy for, uh, for all of you. Um, so oh, in summary, uh, the, the, the NSHAP includes data from uh, computer assisted survey, in-home survey, paper and pencil questionnaires, and biomarkers. Uh, we have a high overall response rate with consistent participation across demographic characteristics. There's and another summary point is that there's unique social network data that's not typically available, unique sexuality data that's typically not available, and data can be accessed through ICPSR at the University of Michigan. So some um, simple find, some basic findings from NSHAP. This is a description of self-rated physical health across age groups and gender groups. Um, and you can see that um, across different age groups and genders, there's a, always a distribution of people with different ratings in health. Um, age itself does not determine that you will have good or poor health. Um, and the other, the other elements I want to share with you are just a, a description of uh, what we know about the social networks of our subjects. So one thing we know is that there's a distribution of the social network size. This is a distribution of social network size in wave one, uh, ranging from um, zero to five, so um, with people with uh, networks of five individuals um, having the, the highest prevalence. Um, and that's the overall social network. And then the household size, the most typical household was a, a, a dyad, a, 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 typically a couple. As people grew, uh, the association between age and um, the size of the social network, as people get older, their social network declines in size, and that's shown in this graphic. This is a, a, the prevalence of sexual partnerships over the lifetime of individuals by different age groups. Um, and you can see that typically people had um, at least one sexual partner of the uh, opposite uh, sex in their life, but there are individuals, there are a, a reasonable minority of individuals with same sex partnerships, um, and it varies by um, somewhat by age group. Um, the probability of a romantic partnership in, uh, is partially also related to health. And in this graphic, the brown line, the, the mustard yellow is actually men, and the red lines are women, and the solid line is for men and women with very good health. And basically, the healthier you are, the more likely you are to have a romantic, a maintain a romantic relationship. But for women, it really declines dramatically as they get older, even when they maintain good health. Um, and the probability of sex in the last 12 months uh, sort of mirrors um, the prior graphic. As people get older, the probability of sex declines. Men uh, appear to have more sexual activity than women, um, which is par partly related to the lack of partners shown, romantic partnerships shown here in the prior slide. Um, so the study has. Um, from its very beginnings, challenged assumptions about aging and sexuality. You know, we've always assumed, many people have assumed that as people get older, there is no sexual activity. Well, that's just not true based on NSHAP. Um, and this is just a cartoon um, making that point. What do you think about the study that says senior citizens are having sex two or three times a month? And the man says, that's all? Um, and, but there are, um, there is sexual dysfunction within the group. And we've captured, this, that's captured in this, um, in this slide. Um, we always think, you know, because of uh, promotion, heavy promotion of Viagra, it's no, not surprising the relatively high rates of erectile dysfunction um, for, among men. But there are many other sexual dysfunctions, including uh, vaginal lubrication problems for women. Um, actually, there's also an interesting um, sizable problem with inability to climax that we've observed in, in, in this general population, but particularly in people with diabetes. Um, so. Uh, for those of you who are physicians or are interested in sexual dysfunction, there's, there's a lot more to dive into in this data set. So with that, I will pass it on to Martha McClintock, Professor of psych Biopsychology. Right, Professor of Biopsychology at the uh, University of Chicago, and I head the Biomeasure group um, along with uh, 
Dr. Wong, who just spoke to you. Uh, I'm going to focus on just a particular story uh, which we thought was um, really interesting for you and that is to focus on olfactory dysfunction and the data we have collected that shows that loss of smell predicts uh, mortality five years later. So I will step you through how we came to that. First is the, the uh, just nomenclature, presbyosmia is the name of the condition for an olfactory decline, typically with aging. So it's not a sudden loss of olfaction, but a decline. And it's very prevalent. So those that are over 80, over 60% of those over 80 um, have experienced a decline, which adds up to millions of older adults who go to see their doctors. Um, and it has a significant impact on their quality of life uh, as well as a clinical impact. And specifically, olfactory loss is in a cross-sectional way associated with major health problems, particularly with uh, neurological problems. So Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment, uh, Parkinson disease, Lewy body dementia. Um, in general, it's a marker for neurodegeneration and future cognitive decline. And then on autopsy, you can see evidence of brain pathology so that we knew going into this that there was this association. But why might that be? Well, I assume most of you are not specialists in the area of olfaction, which is an area of interest of mine. And I just wanted to remind you that olfaction is the most ancient and conserved system. So we have a paramecium here, C. elegans, all of whom depend, each of whom depend completely on olfactory communication to drive their behavior. And in the lower right are some human sperm, um, which have a receptor for bourgeonol, which smells like lily of the valley. It's the one odor that men are significantly more sensitive to than women. Um, and it's expressed on their sperm and thought to help the sperm decide which fallopian tube to go up and find the ova. So it's conserved across species. Now, why would it be related to mortality or to brain diseases in general? The receptor for olfaction is dependent on what's called ionic glutamate receptor, specific kind of channel in the membrane. And each of these species here, the C. elegans, the octopus, the uh, drosophila, have receptors. The receptors are at the two ends of the C. elegans. They're just below the eye in the octopus and they're here in the special appendage in the drosophila. And they depend on ionic glutamate channels. This same kind of receptor, the NMDA receptor, is found throughout the brain. So the fact that we've evolved from simple creatures, these same molecular mechanisms are now distributed widely, certainly throughout the nervous system and throughout the body. So when we published our data showing that if you could smell and there was a loss of smell, that this predicted five-year mortality, you can see the variety of ways science writers decided to summarize our finding. Uh, one of them is The Atlantic, a nice conservative journal said, I couldn't smell and then I died. Or smell tests can sniff out when you'll die. Okay. So what I'm here to do today is to walk you through the science behind this so you can understand exactly what it is we found. As Dr. Wong uh, said earlier, we use these smell pens, and this is my collaborator, Jay Pinto. Um, we would hold them um, under people's noses, and we had in them um, uh, rows, whoops, uh, leather, uh, orange, fish, or peppermint. 
And then the participants were given uh, four words picture combinations, and they had to point to the one that they thought depicted a rose or leather. And the score in this part of the study was based on the number correct. And we defined clinical categories of olfactory function and validated it against clinical studies, defining anosmia, complete lack of smell, is only getting 0 or 1 correct, hyposmia 2 or 3, and then normal smell called normosmia is 4 to 5 correct. We then, from the uh, N-shaped data set, were able to look at a wide variety of mortality risk factors, the demographics you see here, nervous system measures, and then the whole list of clinical risk factors ranging from heart attack, stroke, the, the 10, essentially, the, the top major causes of death in this, uh, age, in this age group in the United States. So, first of all, to look at the age uh, decline in olfaction, presbyosmia, you can see if you look at the solid line, these are people who are normosmic, smell quite well, but at age 55, only 60% of the population um, has perfect sense of smell, and that declines with age. And you see a similar decline in all different levels of um, olfactory function. So the first step that we did is look at people in each of these clinical categories that died uh, or had died five years later. And you can see a very compelling step function going up from 10% for people who had normal olfaction to almost 40% in those that were anosmic. Well, the question is, gee, is that just a result? So we broke it down by age, and we can see you see that there's the exact same uh, step based on olfactory function in each of the age categories. So it's not related uh, in a, to age in the sense of just an artifact of chronological age. But here we now started building larger models, and you can see that in this model, which would fit on the slide for you, you can see that being anosmic was a threefold, um, an odds ratio of three for risk of death five years later, being hyposmic in the middle was 1.5. The probability of death, of course, was higher for older people, higher for men, uh, lower for richer people, and lower for Hispanics, as is well established in the literature. Over on the right, you can see a nice dose-dependent effect here. For each error in olfactory ID, there was a 29% increase in five-year mortality. So what happens if we put in the comorbidity index? Perhaps this is just um, being mediated or an artifact of physical disease, and you can see the odds ratio stays the same. We also tested nutrition, frailty, cognition, mental health, health behaviors. None of these things explained it. We then wanted to compare the effect of or the risk of being anosmic or hyposmic against the risk of being diagnosed with the major causes of death. And you can see that the risk associated with being anosmic is higher than lung disease, cancer, heart attack, the major causes of death. So in conclusion, olfactory decline strongly predicts five-year mortality in older U.S. adults. It is not explained by known risk factors for mortality, that is, being in poor physical health, having a lot of morbid diseases, um, having bad health behaviors, drinking, smoking. It's not explained by decreased cognition or poor mental health, nor by classic demographic factors. So what could the mechanism possibly be? Well, I started out with one possible which is it's a good indicator of neurological decline. In other words, because there's a shared mechanism of ionic glutamate receptors, perhaps this underlies um, 
and that the factory system that we can see is a cold weather. Another hypothesis is the no environment and, uh, to environment salts to pollutants and all the chemicals in the environment. And so perhaps those are both um, olfactory function and also accelerated. My favorite hypothesis, though, is that this and that is uh, just a second here. We're going to. Is it is it okay now? Yes, it's fine now. Okay. Um, so, is there a point I should back up to? You know when you lost me? Well, I'll just carry on. So, my favorite is the stem cell idea. Now, the olfactory system, because it's exposed to environmental uh, disruptors and insult, has evolved the ability to constantly regenerate. So, there are many stem cells in the system that allow cellular repair, DNA repair, and repair of the system. And cell cells are also important for repair and maintenance throughout the, uh, throughout the body. So the idea is that olfactory decline is really the canary in the coal mine of, of human health. That is, it's a marker for global physiological decline. And it's as strong or stronger than any other health or demographic predictor of health. It really provides new prognostic information that puts patients in a very different life expectancy category and therefore has potential translational applications. Um, it's a three-minute test. It's cheap. It's easily administered by people who are waiting to um, see their doctors. And it can identify clinic patients with a higher risk of death, death and therefore can help prioritize their therapies. So I'll now turn the computer over to uh, Dr. Diane Lauderdale. Yes, and I'm going to talk about the sleep sub-study. What you've heard up to this point has focused on data that were collected generally for the entire study, although some of the biomeasures were modularized in prior waves. The sleep study, though, is not part of the core study. It's something we added in wave two and have continued in wave three, and it, it is a roughly one-third random sample of the overall study. So first I'm going to give some information about what's in the sleep sub-study, and then I'll report some sort of summary results addressing two different questions. One is whether people's reports of insomnia symptoms are actually correlated with um, sleep features that would seem to be related to the same kind of sleep problem. And the other is whether these reports of insomnia symptoms or whether the actograph sleep features are more strongly related to different facets of health um, among older adults. So the sleep and activity sub-study, we started in wave two. Um, it, so wave two, as you have heard, included all of the Wave 1 participants who were still alive or able to be interviewed, willing to be interviewed, there was a very high return rate, and their um, co-resident spouses or other romantic partners. One third of them were asked to participate in the activity and sleep sub-study and about 80 percent consented to be in the study. The sleep sub-study then took place after the in-home interview. People were mailed a packet who had agreed, and the packet included an actigraph, which I'll talk more about, instructions for using the actigraph, a little booklet with some extra sleep and activity questions, and a prepaid return mailer. They were instructed to wear the actigraph for 72 hours. 
Altogether, we received back 720, uh, data from 727 individuals with complete actigraphy data and in our target age range. And, and I mention that because some of the spouses were younger and a few older than the target age range, and I'm not going to be reporting data from those. Actigraphy is a non-invasive method of monitoring rest and activity. When I first started doing research with actigraphy, it was a very unfamiliar uh, kind of way of measuring activity and, and sleep for most people, and that's no longer true because it's basically a higher quality research grade of what people have in all kinds of fitness trackers, like a, a Fitbit. Um, but the data that we get are more detailed and less processed. So what it does is it records the number and intensity of movements per epoch. And you can set the epoch in the, the instrument we had. We set it for a short interval of 15 seconds. And the data can be used to distinguish sleep from wake. And here I'm throughout this talk, I'm going to focus on sleep, but there also is data from when people are awake that tell you something about their activity during the day. The, it's not a sort of, it's not a simple, approach to measuring sleep and wake. It's not that people are still completely when they're asleep. It has to do with establishing a pattern of activity in the focal epoch and in the surrounding epochs. We know from looking at people who wear act an actigraph for multiple nights that their first night is no different from subsequent nights. And that tells us that wearing the actigraph doesn't actually interfere with how people sleep. So there's no first night effect. The model that we had available to us was this one that's pictured in the lower right. It's an ActiWatch Spectrum model. They were loaned to us from Philips Respironics, the manufacturer, through their grant review process. Um, the, the models themselves are actually, the research grade models are, are quite expensive. And uh, we were fortunate to have this opportunity because otherwise this would have been exceptionally expensive to have several hundred um, devices, which was necessary because the the, um, you know, the data collection was going on at the same time all across the country. We used the data from the actigraph to estimate a number of summary sleep features. And the data I'm going to be showing you are all the average across all nights. So it gives you the actual clock time when somebody begins their sleep on their main sleep period at night usually, and when they last wake up in the morning. It calculates the number of epochs across that interval that are actually considered to be sleep. It calculates something that's called WASO or minutes awake during the main sleep period. Um, and then it calculates an index of how fragmented that sleep is, um, which adds together the percent of the minutes during the sleep interval when people are moving around, and then the percent of the immobile periods that are less than a minute long. And also, we get the time that it takes people to fall asleep. And we get that because this particular model that we have had a little button, which was an event marker. And we asked people to press it when they start trying to fall asleep and when they wake up in the morning. It doesn't start or stop the recording, but it gives a little time stamp on the data. Now I'm going to show you what the data look like. So this is uh, described as typical actigraph, but it is anything but typical. This is, frankly, the best sleeping person in all of NSHAP. And what I mean by that is that they have um, a, very, uh, a very solid period of sleep. It's the same every night. They remember to push their event marker, which is indicated by that little diamond and in the top left and right corners of each of the blue intervals every single night. And, and they sleep pretty well. So what you see here are a number of different features. The black lines, which go epic by epic across the 72 hours, tell you how many activity counts there are in that epic. So the more active ones are the taller black lines. The yellow lines are the, the this model had a light monitor. And that shows you the amount of light that it's recording at each epoch. And you see that this person does a great job of sleeping in a really dark room. But you can tell on the second night that the light um, starts to increase slowly as before they get out of bed. And you can infer that that's actually the, the sun rising. And they did not have the shades down quite as uh, completely blocking mm -hmm. the light on that second night. 
The blue interval is what the software is indicating as the sleep interval. The little red dots at the bottom indicate epics that are not considered sleep because of the movement pattern. And so this sort of shows you the kind of data and, and how we're able to add up the minutes awake or WASO during the sleep period, the total amount of sleep time, using the event marker, how long it took people to fall asleep. So those are, and then this measure of the mobility over the, the um, interval, the fragmentation. Here's some summary data from that for our, our um, target age group. The total sleep time averaged about seven and a quarter hours. The minutes that they were awake during their sleep interval averaged about 40 minutes. The fragmentation index averaged 15, and it took people on average just about a half an hour to fall asleep after they pressed the event marker. Now, some of the questions that we had in the booklet. We asked survey questions that have been asked in many, many surveys of older adults that we're going to refer to variously as sleep problems or insomnia symptoms, and they key into the cardinal symptoms of insomnia that a, a physician making a diagnosis would be listening for. And these include how often do you have trouble falling asleep, how often do you have trouble with waking up during the night, how often do you have trouble waking up too early and not being able to fall back asleep, and how often do you feel re really rested when you wake up in the morning. And, and these data, as I said, have been collected in a lot of studies of older adults, for example, the APC, the Established Populations for Epidemiologic Studies of the Elderly, um, found that about half the population of those over 65 reported a problem with at least one of these and that they were all associated with all kinds of other health problems. Much more recently, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, or MESA, has similarly found that combining them to actually try to approximate what a physician diagnosis of insomnia would be found that about a quarter of the population had insomnia. So our first question looking at these data was whether people's reports of these insomnia symptoms were correlated with the features of actigraphy that they logically seemed like they would be correlated with. Specifically, did people who reported feeling more rested in the morning, did they actually get more sleep? Was their sleep better quality, which we operationalize as less fragmented? Did people who say they had trouble falling asleep have longer sleep latency? Did people who reported they had trouble with waking up during the night have more was or, or the minutes awake during the sleep interval? And did people who said they wake up too early actually wake up earlier, as we judge by clock time? What we found was a little bit surprising. We found a lot of significant associations, but they're not the obvious ones. First of all, that question about do you usually feel rested in the morning, that was not associated with any activity features at all. The question about did you have trouble falling asleep was associated with, um, it was not associated with actually longer latency, which it seemed like it would be, but it was associated with more minutes awake during the night and people woke up later who said they had trouble falling asleep. The people who said they woke up during the night did in fact have more WASO, which is exactly what you would think. But actually, they had shorter latency, that is, they fell asleep more easily and ended up um, unexpectedly having more total sleep time. And finally, the people who woke up too early by self-report did, in fact, wake up earlier. But they also went to bed earlier, had shorter latency, and had a, no difference in total sleep time. So it seems to mostly be an indicator of uh, circadian phase shift, which you get with aging and not actually getting less sleep. We also added these up to make a summary scale, and that summary scale was associated with more WASO, but also with longer total sleep time, which is, again, not what one would expect logically. So in summary on this first question, um, people who reported more sleep problems, we saw many significant associations between the sleep problems and the actograph sleep features, but mostly they're not the expected ones. And so somehow those questions are tapping into something we're measuring with actigraphy, but it's not exactly obvious what it is. Um, so uh, the question remaining is, are these sleep problem reports or the actograph sleep features more closely related to physical and mental health at older ages. And that's what I'm going to present next, some preliminary data about that. And I'm going to focus on total sleep time, WASO, and fragmentation for the actograph data. And I'm going to focus on the uh, summary measure of insomnia symptoms for our measure of self-reported sleep problems. The physical and mental health measures I'm going to look at are body mass index, frailty, which is a mixture of, um, which is a combination of several criteria. C-reactive protein, the odor ID, which you've already heard about in some detail, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, this multi-dimensional multi 
domain measure of cognition, and self-rated physical health, and also this mental health scales for depression, anxiety, stress, and loneliness. So first looking at BMI, we have one significant association. People with higher BMI report significantly more sleep problems, but there's no association with any of our actograph sleep features. The frailty index, which includes um, both self-report and the measured uh, physical, act, physical function uh, measures, which uh, Albert described, we find uh, associations with both the self-reported insomnia symptoms, but also with WASO and fragmentation. So it's associated with both people's reporting problems are more likely to report frailty and have frailty problems, and also less sleep consolidation is associated with more frailty. For um, CRP, the cognitive assessment, the MOCA, and odor ID, we actually have similar patterns pretty much across all of them. They're not associated with insomnia symptoms. They're not associated with um, total sleep time from actigraphy, but they are associated with our two indicators of sleep consolidation and quality. So people who have um, better, better scores on CRP, better cognitive function, better odor ID, um, have less sleep, have less WASO and fragmentation, which are indicators of worse sleep quality. And finally, we have a very strong pattern for all four of the mental health scales. All four of them are associated with more insomnia symptom reports. So people who have these mental health problems also complain more about their sleep. We see a few, we see associations also though with worse sleep quality with WASO and fragmentation. So um, they also have more of this uh, sleep disruption. So to summarize here, and here I've just picked up fragmentation as sort of, as you saw, fragmentation and WASO tended to to march together in their associations. So for ease of presentation, we just have two here. And, and there are some interesting patterns. Most strikingly, we have some very strong associations between the self-reported insomnia symptoms and body mass index, physical frailty, and all four of the mental health scales. By contrast, we have associations that are particularly strong for cognition, odor ID, um, and also the uh, and CRP for fragmentation. We also see associations with the depression and frailty. But if one were to try to sort of generalize across these, um, it would be fair to say that the self-reported insomnia symptoms are strongly related to physical health and mental health conditions that people are aware of. And the fragmentation, by contrast, has associations that we don't see for, with insomnia, but for conditions that people are not aware of, the C-reactive protein, the MOCA, and the odor ID. So in summary, the actiglass sleep duration was not associated with any of our measures, that is, the total sleep time. However, the sleep problem reports were strongly associated with mental health constructs, body mass index, and frailty. The asymptomatic risk factors for aging-related chronic diseases, C-reactive protein, cognition, the odor ID, were only associated with the actograph sleep quality measures, the, the WASO and fragmentation. There are a number of things we can't say from these data. We don't know whether the mental health and sleep problem connection reflects sleep characteristics that are unmeasured by actigraphy or really have to do with sleep perception and not the actual measured sleep features. And finally, we have no idea from these data yet of what the causal direction is, whether the the physical health um, conditions, mental health conditions, are leading to the sleep problems or vice versa. The sleep data has been um, collected, however, in wave three, so we will, we will have longitudinal data as we move forward. The sleep study had a number of colleagues, and I particularly want to point to Phil Schum, who played a very important role in, in collecting the data and building the database for the sleep data. Okay. We're going to cut off that other mic. There we go. Okay. My name is Alexis Howard. I'm a graduate research assistant on the InChat project. I'm just going to help field some questions today. So go ahead and send those in. I think if you turn off your speaker. The speaker. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, 
So go ahead and send those questions in, but I can get us started. Um, I just had a quick question for Martha to start with. I saw that the scents were rose, leather, orange, fish, and peppermint, and I'm just curious if there were any gender differences in the rates of detection of scents, particularly like rose and leather, if you saw any distinction there. There were, um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, there were uh, uh, women, women perform better than men at this age, except for that one odor <laughs> you talked about. Um, but there was no one specific odor. It, it excuse me, Alexis, when she's speaking. Same thing with uh, race differences. We pick those particular scents because they um, um, are pretty universal and recognized in terms of being able to put a word to it or, or recognize a picture. That's a really good question. Okay. Thanks, Martha. Um, again, feel free to send those questions in, but I did have another one, maybe for Albert, but perhaps all three of you. Uh, this is about the social network size. So I saw that social network size both decreases, well, there's two parts to this question, I suppose. So the first is how you measure your social network size. And the second is whether it's an actual artifact of aging in your training networks or if you think it's a cohort effect, if that makes sense. Um, so the social network, can you hear me? Yeah, is your microphone muted? No, it's on. It's on. So the social network is collected during the CAPI survey, and it's a it's a roster approach. So the uh, individual reports who's in their social network, and they and they name individuals, and so that's how the the size of the of the network is determined. If, um, I, can, if I can add to that as a psychologist, um, social network is a sociological term, and sociologists know what it means. But I would call it number of close friends right. because it's uh, to list the people with whom you can talk to about your emotions or money or a variety of things. So I think it's important for those who don't know this term to realize that it's not the size of everyone you know, but it really are the size of the people with whom you can discuss a difficult topic. Right. And uh, you asked whether or not this was actually aging or a cohort effect. Um, well, it's, we'll uh, find that out in wave three. Right. Whether it's a cohort effect. Right. Because we'll be able to see oh, whether baby correct. boomers have a larger set of people that they are comfortable talking about private matters with. Right compared to the great generation yeah, we've been that's a beautiful studying. that's a great point so co when we're talking about cohort differences we're talking about the, the year the decades you were born do people have social different social networks and ties just because of the era you were born in but there's also simultaneously an aging there's undoubtedly an aging effect uh, the findings related to women have a lot to do with uh, the death of husbands over time and not not replacing the husband over time um, and network size decreases because as you grow older, your friends and, uh, that you knew and grew up with uh, have died and passed on. It's also worth noting that there are actually a number of pretty basic questions that this unusual combination of data will allow, allow explore, uh, investigators to explore and which have not yet been addressed. So to some extent, we can't thoroughly answer your question, and these data are available to explore more features of the network and its determinants of age and cohort. Wonderful, thanks. Um, we had a question come in, wondering if this is for Diane, wondering if Diane did the sensitivity study together. Oh, yes, this is a great question. So we um, do have a couple of hundred couples, so 400 individuals where we have sleep data and for both of them. However, they were not collected at the same time. Um, NORC was concerned that people might confuse their uh, instruments and we might get the wrong person's data so we we sent them out one at a time so you can't actually it, it would be extremely useful to be able to like literally look and say huh 
person A seems to have gotten out of bed and turned on the light. What happened to person B's sleep? Did it get fragmented then? And we can't answer that. We, we just can answer questions about the summary features or their average bedtime. And we've done some exploratory work with that. Great. Um, yeah. So perhaps just to round things out, maybe for all three of you, just very generally what you see. Um, wait, we've got one more come in. Okay, so we have a question about actually taking naps in the actigraphy study. Um, this person would like to know if daytime naps are common in this group and if there's a question on the survey about self-reporting naps and length of sleep. There is. So the, the sleep booklet that went out in the sleep sub-study had a question about, um, had several questions about naps and whether people took a nap each of the days that we have the activity and sleep data and about how long it was. And then um, you can also, it's, it's a little difficult event markers to be absolutely sure when you're seeing a nap or not, but, but it's something that someone could explore to figure out whether you can figure out whether people are actually falling asleep or just lying down at that point. I've done some preliminary analyses, and basically, in this age group at least, we're not seeing naps as a trade-off where people who sleep less nap more. In fact, it's basically someone who's sleepy sleeps more, and they do so both in the naps and at nighttime. And taking naps seems to be a uh, predictor of poorer health. Wonderful. Um, so just to round things out, again, where I was going before, to all three of you, um, what you think the strengths are of InShap compared to other big social surveys that look at aging and or health measures? What makes InShap unique? Um, well, I, I, mean, I think as I said, said at the beginning, um, it is the unique combination of um, different disciplines um, that are being brought together in this study, the unique um, you know, it's definitely a study founded by sociologists, so the unique uh, data regarding people's social networks and social ties, the unique biological data that um, that accompanies it, and the um, I think that the, there will be some really interesting ability to look at different, uh, gen I think we have, um, we're going to have the ability to look at different generations and how aging has changed uh, from generation to generation. Um, Martha? Yeah, I would just build on the on the dyad um, feature, which I think is really important. Uh, being able to look at social um, behavior in terms of social networks and traditional, but also breaking it down to dyads, and we've been able to write and you know just zillions of data out there for you all to. <laughs> grab a hold of and go after. But one of the things that we found when we've done diet analyses is that the psychological state or the behavior of the husband affects that of the wife and it's asymmetric. So the psychological state of the wife does not affect the husband in many in many domains. Um, and we also have data on sexual behavior, which challenges assumptions, but even if people aren't burdened by the assumptions, there have not been the data, and these really are the first data to be able to integrate sexual health in as another dyadic form of social behavior. So uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about why the sleep data in particular is unusual. The, there have been a number of cohorts of older adults, middle-aged and older adults around the country, that have added actigraphy in recent years, but they are not, they're not in the setting of a national, nationally representative study such as this one, which makes even the, the cross-sectional descriptive data about sleep and its correlates um, more, more interesting, more generalizable, and they, they are not in conjunction with these really unusual social variables, marriage variables, and biomarker variables. So there are a number of associations that, that NSHAP is uniquely um, positioned to be able to examine. We, have, we have, are in the field right now with wave three, and we are again collecting actigraphy. So we're going to have longitudinal sleep data for 
as many of the Wave 2 participants from whom we had the actigraphy data as we can, and in addition, a large sample of the new, younger wave. And so I think there are just really interesting opportunities to start to get at whether sleep, the relationship between sleep and health is moving from sleep to health or the opposite. Wonderful. That just about runs us out of time. So thank you to everyone who sat in to hear us today. And big thank you to our three presenters for what you've imparted upon us. So thank you, everyone.